Hello and welcome to the Kiev Post podcast with me, Ricky Rahim Tula. In today's program, we're going to be looking at Chinese investment in Ukraine and the Eurovision Song Contest final. But first, we turn to the investigation into the murder of Belarusian Ukrainian journalist Pavel Sheremet. Sheremet was killed here in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, on July 20th last year in a car bomb. An investigative documentary released on May 10th called Killing Pavel has revealed links to Ukraine's state security service in the murder. Brian Bonner, chief editor of the Kiev Post, has been following the story closely and he joins me now. Brian, in the piece that we run on our front page, uh, we write that the documentary's findings raise the possibility that Sheremet's murder was, quote, a state-sanctioned assassination. So what are the nature of these links between the murder and Ukraine's security services? Well, most directly, a former state security service agent, ex-SBU agent, pulled up in a car out near uh, 120 meters from where Pavel Sherimet's uh, car was parked and at 11 p.m. And he was there for several hours. There was another Mercedes-Benz in front of him with an unknown passenger. And he was there in a position to see the man and the woman who planted the bomb 120 meters below. They got in and out of the car at various intervals. So he was there from 11, uh, about 11 p.m. The bomb was planted at uh, 2.40 a.m. And he drove away with the Mercedes-Benz 40 minutes later. And at 7.40, five hours later, Pavel Sherimet was blown up by the bomb that everyone saw being planted underneath his car. Now, this car that he was sitting in with another man who's identified was registered to a woman who was unrelated, apparently. The car was registered in her name to, to it looks like, to disguise the ownership or disguise who's really using it. Traced it back to the ex-SBU agent, Igor Ustamenko, and... Uh, and confronted him, tracked him down, found him in Odessa. This all comes after, you know, this is a nine-month investigation. The SBU and uh, other law enforcement authorities and presidential administration refused to comment about the findings of the documentary. The minute the documentary is released, the very day the documentary is released, the SBU acknowledges, confirms that this was an agent. We, I mean, we're not going to be able to confirm. They say it was fired in April 2014. There was no way to verify that. This is a this is not your ordinary law enforcement agency. It was, has 30,000, 40,000 agents. They're very powerful, very secretive. They're controlled by the, the president of Ukraine. And uh, it raises many, many troubling questions. I mean, we write in, in the piece that, as you mentioned, that there has been uh, very little progress in the investigation to date in the, in the 10 months. Uh, because of this documentary, Ukraine's interior ministry says it's going to renew its efforts. Uh, but as we point out, over the years, Ukrainian authorities have not managed to solve any high profile murders, including of journalists. Uh, do you think in Sheremet's case, it's going to be the same story? I think it's a dead end. Despite the loud uh, public pronouncements that this is a very important case, from Poroshenko to the general prosecutor to the interior minister, to the SBU head that they were going to, it's a matter of honor, they would solve this. They didn't even do the basic steps in the investigation. Four journalists working part-time for nine months found out more, got more without the power of subpoenas, without the power of that law enforcement officials have to arrest and, and question. They found out more than the official investigators who didn't even bother to canvas the uh, surveillance tapes. Witnesses said, you know, who were talking to Paolo Sherry met that this guy is suspicious, he's sitting out front. Well, the XBU officer wasn't even questioned. So obviously there are many, many, many things missed, uh, basic things. And the question is why? It's either obstruction or incompetence. Either way, it's not good for Ukraine. Shermet, he was a journalist at Ukrainska Pravda. That's a leading news site here in Ukraine. Uh, what do you think his murder, uh, the murder of other journalists in the past, lack of convictions, what does that all say uh, about the state of freedom of speech here in, in this country now? Well, it's very dangerous right now. I mean, I, I think it shows that this is still a, a state that needs to rid itself of corrupt, incompetent institutions 
that seem to have uh, political motives. What happens is that we can't even generate enough pressure domestically in the journalistic community or internationally to force these authorities to do their job and to purge their ranks of, of corrupt officials. Without Sherman's murder being solved, this can happen again and again and again. Ten months after Paul Sherman's assassination doesn't leave one optimistic that authorities have any interest in solving this case. Well, Brian, on that note, we'll have to leave it, but uh, thank you very much for joining us here on the podcast. Thank you. Brian Bonner on the murder of journalist Pavel Shermet. We turn now to the business section where this week we focus on China as part of our World in Ukraine series. Business writer Josh Kavensky was part of the team covering this and he joins me now. Josh, you zoom in on a $3.65 billion loan which China is offering to boost Ukraine's energy sector. The deal has been in the works since 2012, since the time of former President Viktor Yanukovych, but it now looks like it's in jeopardy. So tell us, what's gone wrong? Well, so let's look at what the loan was first intended to do. Um, Essentially in 2012, gas prices were extremely high for Ukraine. What China offered was that Ukraine could use Chinese coal gasification technology in its eastern Donbass region to turn coal into uh, artificial natural gas, which would then be used to heat the country. There are allegations that, you know, there was political cronyism and sort of corruption and how the deal was structured. And let's face it, it probably was. But it doesn't matter now because what happened was is after the Maidan Revolution in 2014, most of the areas where the projects were supposed to take place were uh, occupied by pro-Russian separatist forces. And uh, beyond that, the gas market in Ukraine was totally remade. So the same needs that existed before no longer exist. So since then, what happened was, is that Naftagaz, which is overseeing the loan contract, was given an opportunity by the Chinese to um, submit new proposals within the energy sector under the loan. But the thing is that since then, Naftagaz has narrowed the list down to around four projects. And so far, before they can go to the bank, the Chinese bank, for approval, they need to be signed off on by various Ukrainian bureaucrats, none of whom have signed off on the projects. And you write that uh, Ukraine's ambassador to China has warned that if this falls through, this could negatively impact the entire spectrum of Ukraine-China cooperation on investment. Um, That sounds pretty bad, but as we have written elsewhere in the China section, Chinese investment in Ukraine is actually only about 1% of overall foreign investment in the country. Um, So is there really that much at stake here? There is, yeah. The Chinese aren't investing just because they want Ukraine to be successful. They're incredible. They're investing, and it's let's keep in mind that's also mostly state companies they're investing. They're investing because they want something out of it that's not just economic. In this case, a Ukraine that's not necessarily doesn't have to worry about, about whether or not it's going to rely on Russian gas, one that's more of a counterweight in between Western Europe, in between Europe and in between Russia, um, beyond that, you know, for the Ukraine side, I mean, China needs food. They like buying Ukrainian food uh, in terms of grain and corn. So, you know, the more Ukraine can do to encourage good relations means the more access to a bigger market it has and the more money they'll have coming in. The other, the other also over the sort of elephant in the room here again is Russia, which is that there's been a lot of talk in the past couple of years that Chinese and Russia are these kind of two new. They have this like situational alliance. It's not clear how true it actually is. A lot of people say that's bunk. But um, at the same time, you know, Ukraine wouldn't really want to do anything where it pushes China away from itself. I mean, it's good to have an ally where you can get it. So there's also that aspect to it. One of China's most famous projects is the One Belt, One Road initiative, where it's trying to build uh, these huge trade routes uh, between itself and Europe. But Ukraine is potentially on one of those routes, and it has officially joined the project as of 2016. So far, China isn't showing a huge amount of interest in, in developing this conduit uh, through Ukraine, it prefers to look to Turkey, to Bulgaria, to Romania. Um, So again, is this another area where Ukraine should be looking with this loan deal in mind? It should be thinking ahead. It should be thinking, if we could get this right, well, maybe there's a huge amount of Chinese money further down the line. That's totally true. Um, You know, one analyst told me in the course of reporting this story that, and a couple people actually said that one big issue right now is that the Ukrainian government, not only through the failure potentially of this loan, but through the failure of other projects that came from Chinese state money, there's a big, there's an issue in provoking a big crisis of confidence between the Ukrainian and Chinese governments. That being said, here's an interesting, there's some interesting signs which indicate that the Chinese are going to be in Ukraine in a sort of more independent way for much longer. Uh, recently in November, they bought a, a Ukrainian state bank that was being privatized called the Ukrainian Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And the speculation is that they're going to use that bank 
to basically independently finance their own projects here in Ukraine. I think we can expect the Chinese are going to be here for quite a longer time. They have positioned themselves strategically to maintain that. Well, Josh, it sounds like the 1% of Chinese investment in Ukraine is certainly set to grow one way or the other. But uh, yeah. for now, that's where we'll leave it. But thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We turn now to Eurovision. The song contest has come to an end after two weeks of festivities here in the Ukrainian capital. Portuguese singer Salvador Sobral was the winner, beating out 25 other entrants in the grand final. Our correspondent Maria Romanenko was at the final and has indeed been following the competition closely throughout. Maria, was Sobral's win expected? If I remember correctly, here on the podcast you told us about a week ago that you thought Italy might come out on top. Italy was a bookmaker's favourite for a very long time. It was a good song and I think it was an interesting performance with the gorilla dance and everything. I think the problem with it, and that's what I've heard from other journalists in the press centre as well, was that um, the stage was too dark so the performance was not adjusted to the key of stage and that was a problem that it just didn't look as good as it did when he did it initially in Italy. As for um, the winner this year, Salvador Sobral, um, it was a very interesting song that stood out with its bossa novian um, qualities and I think it positively surprised many people and it was different to everything else. So that's why people voted for it. Uh, and what was Sobral's reaction to his victory? In your piece uh, that you have on the site now, uh, you quoted him as saying, let's not forget that with these things you win today and tomorrow nobody remembers you. So that doesn't sound exactly positive. What was his reaction to winning? Well, he was actually very happy and grateful. Um, but with regards to some of the comments that you just mentioned, I think he was just being realistic and that's uh, laudable as well. And that's probably why people voted and liked him too. He is a very sincere and down-to-earth guy and he made many people smile and laugh during the press conference. Um, so yeah, I think he was just being realistic as it happens with um, Eurovision often that the winners are not actually like remembered that well. I hope it won't be the case with um, Sobral. And what about the rest of the entrants? Uh, as we said, the Italians perhaps didn't do as well as, as people thought they might. Uh, Ukraine came 24th out of 26 entrants. What about overall in the standings? Were there any big disappointments, uh, any surprises? Well, funnily enough, I actually did my own predictions, which I posted on Facebook, and I got quite a few right, um, including the winner and the, the runner-up, um, Ukraine's position and the last place. As for surprises, I was quite upset with the, that Denmark came as low as the 20th. I think their singer Anya, she has a phenomenal voice and it comes across um, with her sound perfectly. So that was one of the surprises for me personally. And what about overall, the competition, when it was announced, people said, oh, will Kiev be able to live up to all the expectation? Will it be done on time, on budget? But what was your feeling? Uh, was the event a success? Well, I think some small uh, scandals aside, it was a success. And that's, I would hope that many would agree with me. I have many international friends who were all messaging me, saying all these nice things, how went it well, how smooth everything was. I would say that it was good, it was a success. Although some of my friends also said that it could have been cheesier <laughs> because it's Eurovision and that's what you expect from these kind of contests and shows. Well, Maria, another year, another Eurovision comes to a close. So thank you very much for joining us here on the podcast. Thank you. That was Maria Romanenko on this year's Eurovision Song Contest. And on that note, that's where we'll have to sign off for this week. Thank you for listening. And remember, if you want to read any more about any of the stories we've been discussing, please visit our website, kievpost.com. Until next week, goodbye.